it gives me great pleasure now to welcome Mr. Rajiv Jain, Chairman and CIO of GQG Partners on DT Now to talk about the deal which has made everyone happy. His 15,000 crore investment in the Dani group of stocks certainly lifted the spirit of Indian markets. Rajiv needs no introduction whatsoever. His understanding of India, his market beating returns and his experience which he brings on table is completely unparalleled. So he's the man of the moment and everybody wants to know that what really is the thinking behind this very large commitment. Mr. Jain, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a Sunday morning and yet you managed to accommodate this interview request. I believe you're joining us from Australia. So thank you very much for that. Well, thanks for having me. I think I think it's it's uh, it's important to get the message across how how we thought about it. So I'm, you know it's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with it, sir. What really is the thinking behind this fifteen thousand crore commitment in Adani Group of companies? So as you know, we were we have followed this group for a while, and um, and and we had never done anything. Um, because as you know, infrastructure is a, has been a tough space. In, in general, we have an underweight infra. In fact, we, we barely any owned anything infra for the longest time. But I think I think the recent events um, kind of made it very very attractive um, in general. And and the other aspect is that the group itself, from a fundamental bottom up perspective, is better positioned. If you look at Adani Enterprise, for example, them getting Mumbai Airport uh, two two and a half years ago, that was a kind of game changer. But the stock ran away. Um, uh, if you look at the the the, the Adani ports and their foray into the more 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 sort of uh, hinterland as such it could could make it very powerful. Um, so I think I think every name had its own unique entity uh, a, a, a sort of a, a elements which made it very attractive. Uh, and and we as you know we have significant investments on the utility type businesses. In fact, if I look at it globally outside of India, we have almost five billion dollars invested in utility type assets, pipeline, airports. Uh, so we do understand those business, and I thought there was a kind of a mismatch between how people look at classic PE type stuff, which is not really the is is not really that 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 sort of relevant in in the stage these companies are. So that was kind of the the genesis of how we thought about these, you know, the the, the whole group. Well, allow me to take the clock back. The sell-off in Adani Group of stocks. Uh, what to your mind led to the sell-off in Adani Group of stocks, and what gives you the commitment that despite the erosion in the equity value, uh, the group is in fine fettle. So as you know, the, the starting point, I mean, the stock, first of all, did run up quite aggressively last year and a half, two years. Uh, and some of them was like Radani Green that ran up along with the other uh, similar names in Europe and other places. So, you know, they, 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 there was a big influx of ESG money, uh, whether index or active, into these kind of names. And, and that obviously you know, made uh, made some of these stocks kind of, uh, uh, you know, a bit expensive versus their own history, and and then this this short sale report came out, uh, which which obviously uh, was was very uh, strongly worded in my opinion. Uh, although as we started peeling the onion, we thought that this was kind of you know, a, a old rehash story, uh, and and the and from our perspective, the substance was not as as as, as meaningful here. Um, but but that that sort of triggered this leg, which 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 took it down. And I think the other part is that the technicalities of the index players involved, uh, so and so kind of made it worse. Right. Uh, the fact that Adani Group of stocks by traditional yardstick are expensive and that debt levels are high, uh, as a fund manager, as an investor. Uh, what gives you the conviction that both the concerns, which historically have been big concerns for any group of stocks, uh, those uh, concerns, uh, according to you in your playbook, is something which is manageable? See, if you look at vast majority, or vast majority of the assets are regulated assets. They tend to a very, very long tail. So when you have, you, you can't have financial leverage along with operating leverage. These companies uh, have very sort of. Uh, predictable long-term trajectory, even if you slow down the growth. So that's the first part of it. And when you adjust for the leverage, in fact, if you look at the U.S. utilities, and, and, and we own a bunch of them, on an average, debt to EBITDA levels in U.S. utilities, and these are some of the best of the breed, is around six to seven times debt to EBITDA. Uh, if you look at the, the leverage here, it's around three, three and a half times. But the growth capex is why the 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 negative free cash flow kicks in. So I think I think uh, they have predictable revenue earning stream that 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 has 20 plus year visibility. They, these are regulated assets. 
And in growth utilities, they tend to have negative free cash flow. That's the norm. That's in fact, you want to have them. You, you want to have them have negative free cash flow. That means because they're they're able to deploy capital on a longer term basis with fairly attractive returns. So the the debt levels, when you look from a utility perspective, is actually on the lower side, not on the higher side. But if they if they lower the capex plans, which they already announced, I think I think I think it becomes a fairly attractive sort of risk reward. The fact that uh, Arani Enterprises FPO did not go through that means the project, the the proposed capital in the company will not come in, and that will have impact on the growth plan. Uh, are you conscious of that? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, no, of course we are, and I think I think uh, that again is a growth capex issue rather than maintenance capex because a lot of these businesses don't have a lot of maintenance capex. Um, uh, so, so I think I think I think uh, on, on, or, you know, from that perspective. Uh, we feel is perfectly fine. They just have to tune down the growth rate, uh, but it becomes a lot more stable and hence arguably higher valuation. Uh, Rajiv Jain has always maintained that the way he invests is that good news and good prices never come together and he never wastes a crisis. So is this some kind of a crisis where you are investing the classic Rajiv Jain way, never waste a crisis? Yeah, look, I mean, I think I think that's that's an important part of what we do because if you think about investing, it's nothing but an arbitrage between perception and reality. If there's a perfect company, so chances are the prices would be so expensive that it be, actually becomes an imperfect stock. Uh, and if, I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, I remember first time when we bought ITC uh, in a meaningful way was 1996 when there was a tax. Uh, 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 liability risk on them, and the stock declined. I believe it was early 1996, by almost 35 percent plus. And as you know, we own ITC. We ended up owning ITC for over two decades. I believe almost 21 years. Then, then if I go back to um, actually 2004 elections, we bought significantly during the elections. The markets are almost 25, 30 percent in matter of days. Um, and uh, then the last one would be the sanctions, U.S. sanctions against India in 1998. And the market is down almost 35, 40 percent matter of six, seven months. In fact, but I will also tell you, I'm telling you some of the winners. So to be fair, I have to tell you one of the losers, which was I got very nervous in early 17 um, after the demonetization, which obviously was a huge mistake. Um, so, so yeah. So in general, uh, you know, if you buy fundamentally sound businesses with a very high barriers to entry, because think about it, you cannot replicate Mumbai Airport. The, uh, can you predict earnings growth of Microsoft? Which is a fantastic franchise. Uh, Twelve months out, they've gone from twenty percent revenue growth to five six percent revenue growth. That 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 is, in other words, compared to Mumbai Airport, it's actually much more predictable long term story. The question is, you got to buy cheap enough. So why did you shy away from buying Adani Group of stocks uh, earlier? They still had the airport. They still had the infrastructure projects in place, and. Uh, they did not have uh, any kind of concerns which a lot of analysts have raised about high valuations and high leverage. What stopped you from buying them in 2020, 21, or even 22? Yeah, so I think I think if you look at the if, if, uh, ports, for example, the regulatory changes have been much more recent, by the way. So I think the, the fundamentals of business today are better in the last two years than they were before at the margin. Number two is, look, we, we deploy a lot of capital. Uh, you, you can't simply start chasing because you, you can't execute in two days or something. You know, you, when you talk about hundreds of millions of dollars, I mean, half a billion dollars kind of stuff, you, 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 you know, we, we would move the price. So we do need some sort of a shakeout for us to enter. Um, and, and, and these things had such a strong momentum. And the valuations were, you know, were getting extended. So we couldn't have executed them in a, in a sort of proper manner versus, let's say, a, a, in my opinion, a mini crisis like what we're seeing now. What is your view on the debt market reaction to Adani group of companies? Uh, there is a royal in the bond market as well. So do you think apart from equity market, the bond market also has, uh, has uh, overreacted? In fact, it's interesting because if you look at the bond markets, they have, they initially reacted, but I mean, they're down to sort of low teens to a high single, depending, I think transmission, I believe is 9% and, and, and green is on 13, 14% and green, as you know, is the most one of the more leveraged ones. So I think I think they behave reasonably well. And I, I do believe that uh, the the if the stock price reacts favorably, those will also come in. So uh, it, globally, interest rates have gone up everywhere in the world, right? So when you look at the spreads, the spreads have not widened as much. I mean, they did for a brief moment, but they have sort of calmed down. Almost all the rating agencies have, uh, have, have reaffirmed. So in fact, the bond markets are kind of telling you the same story that that 
this is not a crisis situation in, from an from a underlying fundamental business perspective. Yes, the growth will be slightly slower than what you would have had without that, but I think that makes it more stable and hence you know, uh, a lot more defensive. So what to your mind could be the growth for Arani group of companies? And uh, when you're penciling in an investment, I'm sure you must have looked at the terminal rate, like you said that you know buying investing is about buying gold at the price of silver. Yeah, so uh, I think I think if you look at uh, depending company by company, uh, green probably has the has the sort of faster growth rate here, uh, but it's also the most leveraged and so on and so forth. But I think on an average, I would say mid teen is very very doable, if not a little bit higher. And if you think about it across India, there are not too many businesses which can deliver uh, at sensible valuations because if, if they slow down, sort of growth capex, the free cash flow will come in pretty quickly. So I think I think you're looking at mid teen plus kind of growth rates. A lot of global investors, and you just refer to that ESG concerns. Uh, do you think this investment of yours, in a sense, gets that ESG endorsement as well? Because that's one concern which, again, has been raised off late by global investors and by global rating agencies. Well, I think, I think if, 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 if I ran my portfolio based on what rating agencies tell me, I'll be a bum on the street. Okay, <laughs> So, so I, 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 I couldn't care less what they say. In fact, I believe, it, it, but if the indices is taken out from an index, I'll be happy camper because I think I think it'll just allow us to increase position if you need to. Mm -hmm. So I think I think a lot of these are kind of mechanical box checking exercises, uh, which really don't mean anything. I mean, so uh, I, I, I'll tell you an example. I mean, Reliance we first started buying in a big way in this cycle in 2016, 20 actually early late 2016 and early 2017. Uh, they had not rolled out the uh, geo at that point, right? And I think similar concerns and uh, were, were there for for those two. So uh, look, I mean, this I'm saying. They, there has to be some 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 reason for pessimism. I mean, otherwise there wouldn't be wouldn't be any pessimism. But I think I, I, I'm I'm actually perfectly happy for the rating agencies to take these stocks out of the index or what have you. I mean, you know, it 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 it'd be a good thing, not a bad thing, in my, in, you know, for for us. You know, it's a it's a rarity for us to get you on. Uh, television and every time Rajiv Jain is on television, he's supposed to make a big prediction. So let me just change gears and talk about what is your outlook in equity market? Post-2020, interest rates came down, interest rates are now going higher. Buffett always says that interest rates are like gravity, they put valuations down. So in this rising interest rate environment, what do you think one should expect from equity markets, especially global equity markets? Yes, so global equity markets, uh, I feel one has to be a little bit more cautious because interest rates uh, have not fully, they've gone up quite a bit, but if, if inflation doesn't come out, uh, come down in a meaningful manner, then, then there's, there's a possibility in, interest rates can still surprise on the upside. In fact, if you look at the consensus expectations on, 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 on US interest rates, they have moved since February, by the way, almost 65, 70 base point in terms of where interest rates could end up by end of this year. So I think, I think there's still some risk. Um, the the other part is by the way, the geopolitical risk on a higher side. So I think we have to incorporate that, which by the way is another reason I actually like India because it has less geopolitical risk. So the risk factors are a lot more favorable in India than most of the other places. Um, if you look at the constant barrage of um, news coming out of Washington DC against China in terms of sanction against companies, products and so on and so forth, that, 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 that is not a recipe for re-rating uh, for, for, for China per se. Uh, so in general, I believe that the, the the market return expectations should be on the lower side, not higher side, because there's been a whole generation of investors who have basically seen nothing but you know low or declining rates, and that I think I think I think I think that movie is pretty much over. In general, the view on India is that Indian economy is in a fine fettle, and we are very proud that we have one of the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, stability, I think, is something which is obvious both in terms of uh, the corporate predictability and the political stability, something you refer to. But my question is that everybody has also raised concerns about valuations in India, the reverse of what I asked you. It's like saying that in India, the market is great, but you're buying gold at the price of diamond. Yeah, look, I think I think, I think uh, valuation is always an approximation, first of all. So. But I think I think part of the India's issue is the index composition, and I'm not saying in a bad way, but just a fact. So if you look at, for example, uh, state-owned banks in India, well, they're selling similar values to state-owned banks in China. Look at energy companies in India, same in China. 
tech companies, very similar in China, but the index composition in China is a lot more cyclical versus index composition in India, India, right? So if you look at pharma companies in China, they're actually a little bit more expensive. Some of the best staples in China are similar valuations in India. So I think when you adjust for that, the valuation gap is not really different, much different. Not to mention if recently companies like Baba and Tencent, the, the government has taken golden share, right? Which basically means that in my opinion, they are quasi state owned. The problem is the state owned companies in China trade at five times earnings, but these private sector companies, which in my opinion are trending towards becoming state owned, they're, tra they're, they're 25 to 30 times earnings. So when you adjust for all of that, I mean, I think the valuations are fairly reasonable. Would you be looking at increasing your India exposure since you are a global fund now and uh, you got the options to invest in other countries as well? Look, I mean, we, we try not to make these prediction whether whether we're going to increase or not. It's a very bottom up story. I mean, so for example, if if let's say the Adani Group hadn't faced the issues that they're facing now, in in my opinion, this is very these are very short term issues. I don't think so. We'll be discussing three five years. Um, uh, we we probably wouldn't have bought those, right? So, so I think I think I think it, it's uh, it's bottom up stock specific, but but in general, our India exposure is is been trending higher, not lower. Uh, but can I safely assume uh, that uh, when you've invested in the Adani Group of companies and the way you've invested in the past, this is not like a trading bet. This is not like a tactical investment. This is more like a trade if all goes well, or investment rather, not trade. I beg your pardon. It's an investment which could be a multi-year investment. Yeah, look, I mean, there's, 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 these are businesses which we really have. In fact, we tend to take 5% of every business. We would not own a business if you're not sure how the business looked like five years. So I think this is this this could be a very very long term trade. Given that, in fact, you... I mean, if you look at the HDFC banks. I think we've owned we owned it for almost twenty plus years. Housing Housing Development Finance Corporation I've owned for twenty four years. So a lot of these names we owned for a very very long time. And by the way, HDFC Bank in two thousand one and two wasn't exactly as as popular as as seems to be in the last few years. Uh, there is an election uh, cycle in two thousand twenty four. As a in global investor, how conscious are you of that? Um, I don't think so I've actually sold or bought stocks simply, you know, before elections, because I think there's more fear than, than, than what, than a substantive change that happens because of elections. Because I think there are a lot of self-driven momentum that you're seeing in various states that the policy, uh, the reforms that have happened last five, six years are quite dramatic. And I think, I think sometimes I feel they, they don't, they, they don't get enough uh, day in the sun, which means that the growth might be a lot more self-sustaining uh in in you know for the for the foreseeable future i mean not saying for 20 years but in the foreseeable future so i don't believe it'll change much at all in fact as i said some of times again there's a mini crisis because elections because people always get either too excited too depressed because of who's you know who's running but i think over the last you know five six years the changes that have taken place the reform that have taken place from almost every sector they they there's a self they, they, there's sort of a self uh, a self-driven element of a lot of these uh, which will help the earnings growth if I just talk about your current holdings, uh, the India romance, some would argue, is centered around IT, consumers, and financials. But you have little exposure to consumer staples and IT. Why is that? Look, there's nothing wrong with them, but but in my opinion, they're, they're, you know, there are uh, there's just better opportunities. So if you look at staples, I mean, ITC last year when we started buying in a bigger way was 14, 15 times earnings with a five percent dividend deal, right? And 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 thanks to the ESG, so I have to give them credit that we, we you know we made some decent money. So we we always have to thank somebody for the opportunity to get in. Um, uh, but we really don't own any other staples. I mean, they're fine, but Hindustan Unilever is not exactly being given away at, I don't know, 55 times plus times earnings. So there's, those are comfortable names to own. And the problem with comfortable names is that it's hard to really beat uh, you know, the averages with those comfort names. In fact, if you look at the portfolio construction today, it looks very different than what I've had in the last 15 plus years. Uh, as you know, I, I mean, I don't know, it's close to 30 years that I've been investing in India professionally. Um, so uh, there's there's a big infrastructure thrust. There's a big uh, uh, thrust on some of the state-owned companies. I think we, we actually like NTPC a lot as an example. Um, uh, we don't own IT services because uh, because they would be more cyclical than what people think. They're fantastic companies, by the way. So if I didn't own anything else, if I'm running an India fund, I probably would own them. But uh, you know we, we like to run it very concentrated. So um, in 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 they they, they 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 you know they they, they just don't fit the bill. When, when you add everything up, there are just better opportunities elsewhere.
There is NTPC, there is State Bank of India, there is NTPC in your portfolio. The common tag here is these, these are PSU banks, these are PSU owned, these are government owned companies. And historically global investors, at least who have invested in India, even the folks who have been investing for more than two decades now, they have not bought PSUs. You are buying them, you invested in them, why is that? Well, I think I think I think you know it's 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 it takes two to tango, right? So uh, for every buy, there's a seller. So, uh, uh, but I think I think I think the 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 first of all, I disagree with something you said. If you were sitting here in 2005, uh, 2005, SBI used to trade at 15, 20 percent premium for foreigners. Foreigners couldn't buy at the market, by the way, right? So so like like everything else in market, that is the sentiment is cyclical, um, uh, and 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 I think I think. I think I think uh, in our opinion it'll change, but the good news is the the way we think about it is that our job is to get earnings growth and the and the dividend combo combination right. If the valuations increase, that's wonderful. But even if they don't increase, we should be able to compound a double digits. That's how we think about it. So we 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 don't wait and hope for others to agree with our view. You know, maybe they never agree, but in the meantime, the earnings growth plus dividend gets us to double digits. We are happy owners. Ajib always insisted that market price is a function of EPS into PE. PE is perception, EPS is growth. In Indian market, where do you think there is scope for PE expansion as well as EPS expansion? And where do you think there is scope of only EPS expansion and no PE expansion? Yeah, I think the second bucket you'll get the companies like Nestle is of this world. I think I think these companies will continue to deliver, but Nestle, I don't know, is 70, 75 times something like that. Earnings have kind of lost track, and as Nestle, as you know, was a large position for a long time. Uh, uh, so, so could 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 they be deteriorated as the earnings growth shifts away to other areas? Because you have to look at one different, well, one aspect. Over the last decade or so, globally, uh, earnings growth was on a slower side. So a lot of these defensive type businesses were re-rated because investors look for growth, including us, right? So growth was scarce. Now, and, and interest rates were low. So, so you know, you, you, got, uh, you got a bubble in tech, uh, not so much in India, but elsewhere. Um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the first bucket, uh, look, I think, I think we talked about some of those. I mean, State Bank of India, why does they have to sell at eight times earnings? Because I think they'll grow at mid-teens plus earnings. So could they, could they deliver those returns? If they keep delivering those returns, could the multiples be higher? I think so. In fact, even some of the private sector banks have late, recently been derated too. So, so in fact, I would argue that most of the names that we own have a reasonable chance of multiple expansion. But if it doesn't happen, it's 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 not the end of the world. What makes you so bullish on State Bank of India? I've spoken about State Bank of India at least four or five times in this uh, conversation. Uh, are you not worried about? And again, I'm being a devil's advocate here. My personal yep. view in State Bank of India is very bullish. But here, I'm asking question as a commentator that their return ratios are not the best in the industry. Their uh, ROA is just about 1%. Private banks in India pretty much have better return ratios than SBI. Mm -hmm. So what makes but look, I think, I think, Yeah, but, but I, think, I think if you look at the, the, um, uh, the corporate side, uh, besides ICICI, I think, I think they're probably one of the better positions on the, on the corporate, uh, corporate book. Uh, but I think, I think the question always is always is what is discounted in the price? So yes, that is, I agree the return ratio is not as good, but who would be able to grow earnings at mid-teens plus in a much more consistent manner and what the market is not anticipating? I think, I think that's where we believe the rubber meets the road in terms of the gap between what I, you know, what I say perception and reality. So at eight times earnings, uh, if you take a five-year view and they grow earnings at, let's say, mid-teens plus, it becomes a fairly attractive proposition, uh, especially, on, uh, especially because they have a much better... I mean, there are a lot of private sector banks who have really no experience in lending to the corporates, by the way. But that was a strength for them. But could that become a weakness going forward? Have you had a look at uh, the Indian internet and consumer tech companies which have gone public? Uh, there's a Paytm, there is a Nika, there is a Zomato. These are exciting businesses. These are businesses which some would say are the future high growth businesses of this decade. Yeah, look, we, we 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 look at a lot of things, and we looked at some of the the, the U.S. and and the European ones too, and 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 um, and if you look at the profitability uh, uh, expectations that these companies had, they're being they they, they you know they, they they are being cut pretty pretty aggressively, and the reason is some of these businesses have really no barriers to entry, so the growth is fine, but is this sustainable long term growth? And one of the things we look for all the time is. What are the barriers to entry? Can we can somebody else replicate those businesses? And and at this point, there is no evidence that these are truly 
business that have any pricing power or 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 sort of you know uh, 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 barriers which can make it difficult for others to come in. So the valuations are still on expensive side uh, for what they're delivering. But but you know, I mean, I'm not saying people can make money. They, you know, as as they say, there are hundred ways to heaven. You just need to find one. Uh, but but from our cup of tea, they 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 they're just better fishes to fry in some of the other areas. Uh, Mr. Jain, uh, every market follows a cycle, and there's always a theme which is at play. So in 2000, it was TMT. Then it was infra between 2003 and 2008. Then good old consumer stocks, which you bought aggressively, uh, you know, the HULs and the Nestle's of the world. Can I say that looking at your portfolio positioning in India, you are betting on the infrastructure boom uh, for next three or five years? Look, I think, I think, I think we, we, are, we, are, we are pretty bullish on that because I think there are a lot of things in place because the execution under this administration has been strong, which, which, which is important here. Uh, and, and the second part is that we saw the similar uh, in China, in that stage of development, where the infra spend actually took off in a big way almost 24, 25 years ago. So we feel that India might be in a similar sort of setup uh, where, where the earnings growth could accelerate. The problem is there are only few and far names in the infra side, right? Quality names, I mean, they, they're not dime a dozen. Like banks, you, they, they, they are a lot of, you, there are a lot of names you can play. If you look at consumer staples, there are a lot of names. Uh, but infra side, there's, there's a little bit, little bit dearth of those. I mean, uh, the A. Maybe these Siemens are just too expensive, and people kind of gravitate to, towards those. Um, but but I agree that I think if I take a five plus year view, which is which is what we take, uh, uh, none of what we we do is sort of on a short term basis. I think I think infra we feel is a lot better place to be. And general foreign investors are totally missing in that space. By the way, uh, IT services, and pharma, uh, uh, or, or especially consumer staples is kind of a what I call comfort zone. I'll take the liberty of asking one more question. I'm shamelessly extending my appointment with you. Every investment which you do comes with an underlying risk. So for any group of companies, how would you define your risk? What could go wrong which you currently are aware of, but that is something which you are, you are factoring in? What is the risk according to you? Well, I think, the, the, as, as you said, there are always some risk in that. I think, I think the risk would be the growth slows down dramatically um, uh, in 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 some 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 of the companies that we own because the regulatory issues that they might face on a go forward basis because in regulated businesses the biggest risk always is regulation right uh, that's a that's that's the positive but that's a negative uh, so I, I, we don't see any signs of that yet um, I, I, one of our concerns was you know in terms of sort of managing growth um, because these are complex projects I think I think uh, that by the way is, is is sometimes not well appreciated is that. The barriers to entry in infrastructure anywhere in the world are very high, particularly in India. Execution extremely difficult. Uh, I mean, you might remember that POSCO Iron and Steel tried to acquire land for seven, eight years, couldn't even acquire land, and then they left. So greenfield projects are very, very difficult. And 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 that's what I actually we quite like it about this group is they have shown remarkable ability to execute on greenfield projects. Uh, and 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 I feel that like they they don't get full credit for that um, in terms of ability to pull that off. On behalf of everyone from ET Now, thank you so very much for joining us on ET Now. And thank you for, frankly, answering all the questions. You've been very patient and you've been very vocal about your thought, why you've invested in the Dani group of companies. And every time I've interacted with you, I've learned something new. And today the learning for me is always, always look at the long term. Don't look at the noise. If you filter it, you'll always get the bargains. Really appreciate your time, sir. Thanks. It's, it's, it's great to catch up again. Thank you very much.